All right, here we are, Exodus for, uh, Exodus for beginners. Uh, this is uh, lesson number one. We're starting a brand new series on Exodus. And of course, uh, as usual with our series, we begin with the first lesson, uh, introduction, and the subheading of the introduction is called the golden thread. And I'll explain that idea to you in a moment. Uh, one of the uh, resource books that I, um, that I used for this study, um, Commentary on Ex Exodus by D.A. Garrett. Uh, Mr. Garrett summarizes perfectly the difference between the books of uh, Genesis and the book of Exodus, but also the essential purpose of the book we are about to study, uh, which is the book of Exodus. Here's the passage in question and I quote it. Exodus is the true beginning of the story of Israel. Genesis is essential to the story, but it is a prologue describing the lives of individual patriarchs rather than the history of a people. With Exodus, we begin the story of the national entity called Israel. Uh, in other words, in Genesis, the scene is set for the story that the Bible has been written to tell. Uh, and that story, of course, how and by whom the natural world came into being. Uh, the details explain mankind's creation and purpose, fall into sin, and of course, the consequences of his sinful state. Uh, Genesis also records God's promise of an eventual savior and his selection of one man, Abram, who later became Abraham, through which he would send his savior. And of course, uh, the book of Genesis finishes by focusing on the growth of this one man's family into a clan of 12 families, each led by the descendants of this one man, Abraham, who was originally chosen by God. Now, the book of Genesis covers a period of approximately uh, 2,200 years between creation and the arrival of Jacob and his sons uh, in the land of Egypt to join Joseph, his lost son, who had become second in command to Pharaoh. And we know that story, uh, we know that story well from Genesis. Now during this period, the world began to be populated not once, but twice on account of the great flood in Noah's day. Again, all of this information is in Genesis. Uh, nations were formed, uh, cities were built, wars were fought, inventions, innovations, and languages were developed, creating a rich history of people and events uh, studied today by archeologists and historians. The Bible, however, is only interested in these histories insofar as they intersect from time to time with the history and the progress of this one family began by Abraham, the man specifically chosen by God for a special purpose. It's, it's as if the history of the world is this you know, gray backdrop in the Bible and the story of Abraham and his descendants is a bright golden thread that stretches from Genesis all the way through a uh, revelation. And no matter what is happening in the world, great or small, that golden thread is visible from its beginning with Abraham all the way through every chapter of history until it finds its natural completion and end point in Jesus Christ. And so we see its beginning in Genesis, as I've mentioned, with the formation of the 12 families who through various circumstances uh, will find themselves sojourning, meaning living temporarily in Egypt uh, because of a, a terrible famine uh, uh, in the place where they lived in the land of Canaan. Now in Exodus, we will follow that golden thread as we see that clan of families transformed into a nation and observe as that nation uh, as that nation comes to know the true God, the I am, the Jehovah God, who will now be their only God. 
We will observe his power to break Egypt with plagues. In the book of Exodus uh, is contained the giving of the formal law and observances uh, that the nation will be bound to and will inform every part of their lives. And it is in this book, the book of Exodus, that the sacrificial system, uh, worship, uh, the priesthood and the place of worship are all explained and physically given. In other words, everything that makes these people distinct and separate as the people of God is introduced, initiated and explained in the book of Exodus. And I say that, uh, I begin with that simply to emphasize the importance of the book of Exodus. Without the book of Exodus, we wouldn't know who, you know who the Jewish people are, where they come from, how they got to be who they are and why they do oh, you know, what, they, what they did. So a very important uh, book. So we begin the introduction of uh, Exodus uh, in our normal way. You know, we start with the critical introduction. And so we start with um, uh, authorship and date. The book of Exodus is part of the Pentateuch which is the term used for the first five books of the Bible, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those are the first five books uh, in the Old Testament, what we refer to as the Old Testament. Uh, the Pentateuch is made up of two Greek words, penta, meaning five, and tukos, uh, meaning scroll. And so the Jews refer to the Old Testament as the Hebrew Bible and the first five books as the Torah or the five books of Moses or the books of the law. Moses has traditionally been considered the author of this book, even though the book itself does not mention its authors. However, the author was uh, uh, intimately familiar with the events that took place in the book. I mean, if you read the book of Exodus, the person who wrote it is, is an eyewitness of, of the events taking place, actually participates in the action itself. Uh, the author had access to information that only Moses could have known. Uh, for example, the interactions that he had with God and, and, and wrote about these. And also the author was present and a witness to the miraculous events, uh, the good ones and the bad ones uh, that took place at that time. Uh, conservative scholars name Moses as the one who compiled and recorded uh, oral traditions, genealogies, and personal eyewitness accounts into one orderly record of the Jewish uh, people's departure from Egypt their wanderings in the uh, wilderness and interactions with God. Uh, Jesus himself uh, attests to this in the New Testament. In John, for example, John chapter five, verses 46 and seven, he says, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So Jesus attests to the fact that Moses is the one who wrote the Pentateuch and was writing in a prophetic way about his own coming. He continues to say, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? John 5, 46 and seven. And then in John 7, 19, he says, did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you carries out the law. Why do you seek to kill me? So when he says, when Moses gave you the law, well, we'll read eventually in Exodus, how God gave the law to Moses and Moses gave the law uh, to the people and all the observances that God gave to Moses, Moses passed on to uh, the, uh, the people. So we have Jesus himself uh, a witness uh, to the fact that Moses uh, is the one uh, who wrote uh, the uh, law. Now, as far as time is concerned, Moses uh, wrote this book somewhere between 1445 and 1400 BC. Uh, this is the traditional date that allows for Moses' life in context of biblical history. And it also aligns with the dates of other uh, characters uh, in the um, Old Testament as well as uh, various events. 
Some modern critical scholars deny that Moses wrote this book and that it was written during the Jewish exile in Babylon in the sixth century BC and completed after the Jews were freed to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and the walls and so on and so forth. This particular theory, however, does not explain why Jesus himself attributes the writing of the law or the Torah to Moses, as we have read in John chapter 5, 46 and 47. So if, if you're to take this other position that Moses didn't write it and it was written later on, then you also have to deny uh, what Jesus uh, said uh, about Moses writing the uh, first uh, five books of the law. You know, it's like a domino effect. If you deny the first thing, you know, it bumps into other uh, proofs that appear in the Bible and uh, eventually destroys your theory. Of course, a lot of the action takes place in uh, Egypt. And so I think it would uh, help us to understand uh, a little bit about the country of Egypt at that time. Uh, the word Egypt referred to the uh, original name of the city of Memphis. Uh, I'm not talking about Memphis, Tennessee now, I'm talking about Memphis uh, in Egypt. Uh, the original name of the city of Memphis was Mansion of the Spirit of Tam. And so the name Egypt uh, it comes from the root of that. A Little bit about the uh, geography of uh, Egypt. It is a country uh, in North Africa, an ancient country in North Africa. Um, the Nile River uh, made human habitation in Egypt possible. Uh, the river itself flowed from its source in the south um, in uh, Lake Victoria, which is uh, situated in modern day Uganda and Tanzania and it flowed northward to eventually empty into the uh, Mediterranean Sea. There is a debate whether the Nile uh, in Egypt or the Amazon River in South America is, is the longest, you know, they go back and forth, but when we're talking about, you know, the longest river in the world, we're talking about like 40 miles or something like that, a difference. So an amazingly long, um, an amazingly long uh, river. With its uh, annual floods, the uh, Nile not only provided drinking water, but it also cast up fertile soil on its banks to provide fertile ground for the planting of crops. This fertile strip adjacent to the river was called the Black Land, and the desert beyond it was called the Red Land. The Nile River Valley was Egypt, since everything else was wasteland and not habitable. When I talk about the, uh, uh, the, the valley, I'm talking about you know, the, the river and you know, the several miles of fertile soil along the river. A large part of the ancient kingdom south of the rich Delta region, which was in the north, you see this uh, in the map there near the Mediterranean Sea. So a large part of the ancient kingdom that was south of the Delta, uh, was hundreds of miles long, but as I mentioned, only about five miles wide, uh, because this is the only place where people could, uh, could live. The main cities, uh, the farming, the wealth, the population were located in the Northern Delta region called Lower Egypt, and the Southern Strip was called Upper Egypt, since the Nile River flowed from south to north, the southern region was called you know, upriver. And so you have the various cities that you note on this map here. Uh, Memphis was the capital city during the old kingdom period. And we'll talk about the various periods in ancient uh, Egypt. Uh, Thebes was the capital uh, during the new uh, kingdom. And uh, we talk about the land of Goshen, you know, uh, that, uh, uh, Jacob and his family uh, habit, uh, you know, lived in um, the land of Goshen. Well, the land of Goshen is up in the uh, northern, uh, you know, the east, northeast part there in the, uh, in the Delta. Uh, Egypt's geography largely protected it from enemy attack. For example, to the east uh, was a harsh desert and of course the Red Sea. Um, to the west uh, 
was the vast Sahara Desert. To the north uh, was the great Mediterranean Sea. And then to the south uh, were natural waterfalls in the Nile itself, which made naval attack uh, very difficult. The greatest weakness uh, geographically, if you wish, was the overland route in the Northern Corridor, which connected the Delta region in the North there, the green part that you see, connected that with the land of the Canaanites. And later on, uh, the uh, land of the Israelites. So you had this Northern, uh, this northern route uh, that got you into this uh, particular uh, territory. The greatest strength uh, of the country was the abundance of food that they grew in the Delta and the Valley to provide for their nation and export to other countries. Now, they also had an abundance of gold and precious stones, which showed up in the beautiful artworks that they uh, produced that are uh, available and to be seen in various museums even to this day. They also were great producers of food. And uh, that's uh, you know, behind the story of uh, Joseph when he, is in, uh, when he is in Egypt. A little bit about the history. Egypt uh, was uh, ruled by pharaohs uh, that lasted uh, 3000 years. It was the first world power. Uh, its history can be divided into 11 major eras and uh, in briefly reviewing these, we can also begin to see where Egypt's connection to the Jewish people appear historically. So let's take a look at the chronology of ancient uh, Egypt. Uh, scholars put the date of the Exodus uh, at around uh, uh, 1447. So let me just uh, show you a little bit of the you know, history here uh, before we um, position you know, when, when Joseph entered uh, Egypt, when the Jews were there. So you have the pre-dynastic uh, uh, era uh, prior to 3000 BC. That shows you how old a country this is. Uh, Egypt was not unified at that time. The uh, archaic uh, era, uh, between 3000 and 2700 uh, BC, Egypt was unified. Uh, classical Egyptian culture uh, was established at this time. You have the Old Kingdom uh, period, uh, the third to the eighth dynasty, 2700 to 2160 BC. This is the pyramid age when the pyramids were built and Egypt uh, was uh, powerful and, uh, and united. You have the first intermediate uh, era, ninth and 10th uh, dynasties, 2100 to 2000. Uh, during this time, there was chaos, uh, disunited uh, Egypt. And then we enter the Middle Kingdom. This is uh, the 11th and 12th dynasties, 2100 to about 1786 BC, uh, a second era of power and unity, which overlaps with the first intermediate. Now, the important part of the Middle Kingdom is that this is the time we believe that Joseph uh, uh, was, um, you know, Joseph was brought uh, to Egypt and we know the story, uh, how he rose to power, becoming second, if you wish, in command of the nation uh, during the famine. And it was during the famine that his brothers came uh, to find food. And eventually the family was reunited and brought to Egypt uh, to uh, live. A little more information here, more eras, the second intermediate era, 1700 to 1550, uh, weakness and division. This period includes the uh, Hyksos uh, dynasties. And then we have the new kingdom, uh, the 18th to the 20th uh, dynasty, 1550 to 1069. And this is important because Egypt's imperial age, the Exodus probably took place in the 18th or 19th dynasty. This is where the exodus uh, took place. So uh, we can continue third intermediate, the state, uh, the state uh, Persian uh, era, the Tol uh, Ptolemaic uh, period, and then the Roman period after 30 BC, 
there was a decline and it was the end of classical Egyptian culture under Roman uh, domination. So uh, uh, what we do know for sure uh, are the events and the sequence as well as the characters involved uh, because God has uh, preserved these uh, as that you know, golden thread that spans human history and reveals the story of how he eventually saved mankind from the consequences of sin. The point I'm making is you have this ancient uh, nation and uh, it has you know, uh, so many eras and so many events uh, taking place uh, during uh, the 3000 year history of this nation. And, and what we have in the Bible is just that golden thread, you know, two, two periods in their history. One where Joseph appears, you know, and then several hundred years go by, and then where Moses appears uh, to lead the people out of uh, e Egyptian uh, bondage. That golden thread simply appears you know, a few times in their history and then moves on and their history continues, but the Bible doesn't record it. The Bible doesn't even refer to it anymore. So uh, this is a, a, basically a summary of the history of uh, Egypt and uh, at which point uh, the Jewish people uh, came in contact with that nation and with the kings of that uh, nation. So let's move on to the summary, if you wish, and the purpose of the book of uh, Exodus. Exodus is first and foremost a historical record that traces the period of time and events that take the descendants of Jacob and his family from Egypt, where they fled to for safety from the famine, taking place in the land of Canaan, which was their home at the time. Uh, and then uh, we go back through a long journey in the wilderness to the place uh, where they uh, came from uh, 400 years earlier, but this time uh, to re-enter their former dwellings as conquerors, receiving from God the land that was promised to their forefathers. In other words, if we keep our eye on that golden thread, we'll see uh, Joseph being sold into slavery and then a long period of time goes by, four centuries actually, and then Moses appears and, and you know, rises up to be a leader uh, among the uh, uh, Jews. And we see God's great uh, miraculous powers working to free the, the Jewish people who have become slaves in Egypt and lead them out of Egypt uh, and into the wilderness and eventually into the promised land, the land that they had uh, escaped, the land that they had left because there was a famine 400 years before that. But if we follow the thread, the thread will simply take us from you know, Joseph to Moses uh, and then back to the, uh, back to the uh, uh, promised uh, land. So Exodus um, is the history of that return journey and the transformation that God works as he literally creates a new and distinct nation out of a people with no leader, no purpose and no power, having developed as a slave population while living in Egypt. The book of Exodus tells us this story. Uh, uh, Exodus is more foundational as far as the Jewish religion is concerned, since it has more central places in Jewish history than the book of Genesis uh, does. Uh, for example, according to Deuteronomy chapter uh, six, verses 20 to 25, when a, an Israelite uh, child uh, asked his parents uh, why they were under so many religious rules and regulations, the answer was to be, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but Yahweh brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. So for the people of Israel, their founding event was not the call of Abraham recorded in Genesis, uh, but the events that are contained in the book of Exodus. Their history as a distinct people, the people of God, along with the religious practices that guided and confirmed uh, uh, their, uh, their uh, position as God's people are all found in Exodus, not in 
the book of uh, Genesis. So Exodus uh, provides the uh, explanation for the claim that the Jews were the people of God, the uh, chosen people. You know, if someone says, how do you know that the Jews were the chosen people of God? Where does it say that? Well, you would take them to the book of Exodus and you would read and show them, you know, how these people who were not a people became a nation, uh, became God's people. And the book of Exodus explains how that, uh, how that happens. All right. So we have some main characters in the book of Exodus. Uh, first of all, the Jewish people. As I say, Genesis provides the backstory of who the Jews were and how they came to be in Egypt. Uh, however, Exodus introduces them in the first seven verses and simply adds that from a small beginning, they grew into a large and powerful population that actually threatened the native Egyptian population by their growing numbers and uh, potential influence. Uh, they had no leaders uh, which are mentioned among them. No one spoke on their behalf as a group. Uh, they were still an association of clans led by family uh, elders. Another uh, main character of course is uh, God uh, himself. In Genesis, we see God's power in, in creating the universe and his dealings and appearances to individuals. In Exodus, we begin to see other aspects of his being. He is, for example, the one and universal God. In Exodus 3 verse 15, God refers to himself as the I am, as the I am, and this sets him apart from every other God. Uh, he is also the God of wrath. From the plagues on Egypt to the thunder and lightning on Mount Sinai, God demonstrates his ability to punish and intimidate his enemies as well as uh, his disobedient people. And he's also the God of mercy. Mercy is his primary characteristic and not wrath. And this is shown by his compassion in response to human suffering you know, the Egyptians uh, were enslaving uh, the Jews and they were crying out to God. He endures uh, patiently the repeated provocations of the Jews when they complained and they were ungrateful or they rebelled against him. Uh, and he forgave and restored them after their grave sin with the, uh, with the golden calf. Um, he's also the God uh, who is wholly other, he is completely holy and unlike man. Moses had to remove his sandals to enter the holy space of the burning bush. And God only interacted with the people through Moses uh, who became his sanctified servant. He was also the God of Israel. The Jews became a special people through divine intervention a sign that God can interact with humans without destroying them. And he is the God of the moral law. The people of God are bound to his laws, which are holy and righteous and moral and very specific. And so the point here is that no other God revealed himself in such a personal and dynamic way as this God, as the God of the Jews. Uh, he was above man, uh, not because man had placed him above the, among rather the deities, uh, which is what happened with the pagan gods of the Egyptians. The Egyptians are the ones that invented these gods and placed them you know, in the pantheon of their, of their gods. Uh, uh, the God of the Jews was above man by virtue of what he revealed about himself. Being above man was the natural place for him uh, to be. And a third uh, main character that we find uh, in, uh, in the book of Exodus is, uh, well, Moses, of course, Moses, the man of God. Now the book of Genesis, excuse me, the book of Exodus seeks to glorify God, but it also establishes Moses as the founder of the nation of Israel. Moses is a new Adam, a new Noah, a new Jacob, he is a man who is molded by God for greatness, despite 
his personal flaws, despite his uh, mistake. Uh, for example, he recklessly kills an Egyptian in trying to assert himself as a leader and a potential savior of his people uh, early on in his life. And then he lives in self-imposed exile, underemployed as a, a shepherd in the wilderness. Uh, then he refuses to speak as God's representative so that God has to provide Aaron, his older brother, to carry out this task. And of course we see he flashes a bad temper. He has a quick temper when he violently throws down and breaks the tablets upon which the commandments were written by God. Uh, uh, upon seeing the people worshiping the golden calf, he sees the people worshiping this idol and he's so angry he throws the, the tablets that God himself had written on. He throws them on the ground and they, they break. So uh, we see several times that his temper uh, gets him into trouble. However, God patiently brings him to spiritual maturity, even greatness, because despite his failings, Moses never abandons his faithful service to God. Even after he is told he's not going to enter the promised land with the people because of his disobedience, and in many instances, his disobedience caused by his temper. Anyways, because of his disobedience, uh, this time in striking the rock twice, instead of speaking to the rock in order to draw water, that story we read about in the book of Numbers chapter 20, uh, even though he is told by God, he's not going to enter the promised land, he continues to faithfully serve God as best he can, following his instructions, helping to establish uh, Joshua as the one who will continue his leadership role. So uh, Moses is the great as well as relatable role model for weak and sinful people who sincerely aspire to please God and serve him in important and dynamic ways. Good role model for that. And then a fourth main character is Egypt itself, uh, the symbol of worldly power. Egypt represents every worldly power that God's people have had to deal with in every era. It is the antitype for every worldly kingdom in opposition to the kingdom of God from the beginning uh, to the final day of this ongoing conflict to the end when Jesus comes to destroy it once and for all time. Worldly powers, uh, worldly kingdoms who worship gods of wood and stone, worldly kingdoms who concentrate power in the hands of few, in this case, in the hands of Pharaoh, worldly powers who oppress the righteous with slavery and murder and hatred and separation, worldly kingdoms and powers who have a fixation on material prosperity as a major factor in decision-making, worldly kingdoms uh, who uh, are dependent on the power of the occult and the influence of dark power and legitimize this type of thing in their, uh, in their, uh, in their power. And worldly powers who represent and facilitate apostasy. You know, I've never seen a government that actually promotes uh, the belief uh, and, and, and the belief and obedience to, uh, to uh, Jesus Christ, They're usually the other way around. So Egypt, just as every world power since, except perhaps in certain ways and for certain times America, Egypt featured these symbols of worldly kingdoms, which were all on display in their dealings with the uh, Jewish people. They did all of the things that worldly kingdoms do to uh, believers. And so Exodus reveals for the first time the features of the king of the heavenly kingdom, as well as his power and ability to subdue and to destroy even the mightiest of earthly kingdoms and earthly powers. And so from the beginning of the Bible, with the Egyptians and throughout the Bible with the Assyrians or the Babylonians all the way to the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation where God's kingdom 
uh, eventually defeats the greatest of the earthly kingdoms and that was Rome, the story is always the same. God's kingdom on earth today, the church, will never be defeated by an earthly kingdom and will continue this winning streak until Jesus returns to finish the struggle with his judgment and final removal of the heavens and the earth along with all the earthly kingdoms, leaving only one kingdom to exist and rejoice with him in uh, eternity. And, and we get to see God uh, working this plan uh, as we follow, as I mentioned, that golden thread that begins in Genesis and works its way throughout history, through the various kingdoms and through the various wars and happenings and uh, you know, uh, goings on of this, uh, this uh, world and the various nations, we follow that golden thread that will take us finally to the return of Jesus and the beginning of uh, eternity. And so Exodus uh, is uh, the story of the formation of an early stage of this heavenly kingdom, if you wish, which is the nation of Israel and the defeat of one of the first of these earthly kingdoms, uh, which is uh, Egypt. And that is uh, for this morning, for this time, our uh, our lesson, our introductory lesson on the book of, uh, on the book of Exodus. Uh, next uh, time we get together, uh, we're going to look at the outline of uh, the book itself, give us an idea of what's going on, the various activities taking place in the book of uh, Exodus. And I would encourage you to read ahead. In other words, uh, this week, uh, uh, read chapters one to 10 in the book of Exodus because uh, in our method of study, I, I'm not going to, you know, it's, this is not a line by line study, okay, where we get to read every line. We, we don't have time to do that in the number of lessons here, 13 lessons in this series. So we, we go from one section to another. And so I'm going to assume that you have read the material. Uh, I'm only going to read certain parts uh, of things and it'll be much more edifying for you uh, if, you um, if you read ahead. Also, I encourage you uh, to make sure you have your notebooks, the, the, the workbooks, the student workbooks that you have where you can take notes and there's lots of information in that workbook that I don't necessarily refer to or don't have time to talk about here in class, but uh, the workbook has the extra information that you'll need and as, uh, as everything with Bible Talk, you can download a free PDF copy of that uh, you know, on our website, bibletalk.tv, or if uh, you don't feel like doing all that, you just wanna get the book, you can always uh, order it. Uh, I don't know, it's three or $4 or something, and uh, they'll send it to you in the mail and you'll have uh, you know, a nice copy of it with a hardcover, and, uh, uh, but it'll be the same material that is contained inside. So I thank you for joining us for this first uh, lesson in the series. I wanna thank uh, folks uh, who are watching online uh, and in the same way, I encourage you to, uh, uh, to uh, download the uh, workbook. Uh, if you're gonna follow along with this, you'll find it to be very helpful. So God bless you and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.